So, yeah, but the, the question on the, um, on the table is from the Solomon question, and what, what's the anthropogenic radiative forcing? I'll just go ahead and write that down on a new sheet here. So, so F equals And remember, N was the uh, net flux. So the net, the radiative forcing is caused by um, accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, What's, what's not clear in the paper, and so there's, there's a couple different things. Like, let's say I go out and um, start a fire on purpose, you know, start a forest fire and send up all this CO2 into the atmosphere. So that would be anthropogenic radiative forcing. If, you know, lightning strikes somewhere uh, a million years ago and releases greenhouse gases, that's also radiative forces, but it's not anthropogenic. Yeah, right, right. So, I, yeah, I found a little explanation here. It says net radiative forcing, and it has in parentheses warming by anthropogenic greenhouse gases, less cooling by stratospheric and tropospheric aerosols. Right, because there are some there are some other apparent um, activities that that humans do that actually cool the atmosphere, and one. Um, geoengineering fix actually because if a, if a volcano goes off and sends a bunch of ash into the stratosphere it tends to reflect sunlight back and so there have been proposals to say hey what if we tethered some garden hose and just squirted hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen sulfide <laughs> way up into the stratosphere we would you know we would, we would then we would have uh, a zero net flux just change the color of the sky yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, you know, people, we, you know, we go back and forth all the time about should, should we do geoengineering, should we not do it? Like, well, too late, kind of did, Panama Canal, Great Wall of China, uh, U.S. interstate system, uh, you know, it's slippery slope when you start That's talking about it. this paper adds emphasis on the classification between um, natural increases of heat as opposed to human. Anthropogenic, so, yeah, it's true, human. it's true. And, I, and, what, and the, the big takeaway on the paper is let's pretend, let's hypothesize that we emit no more greenhouse gases at all. What's the decay time look like? Okay, so the, the, the next question, and, and I'm just going to throw this out there. If you're like really bored, nothing else to do, here it is. <laughs> Design a um, snow removal system that... Very relevant this time of year. I have totally giant cramps in my <laughs> thumbs and my hamstrings are killing me. Um, and I'm, you know, we're watching these plows drive around and all that. But design a snow re removal system that runs on the power of falling snow. So there's energy there. You know, your one half mg squared per snowflake, and there's your E equals mgh as those snowflakes lose energy, so that's the problem. And I'll put, a, I'll put a discussion. It's not an assignment, you're not going to get graded on it, but it's just like, could, could the power of the snow itself remove itself? Or, if it couldn't like completely remove itself, what fraction could you? Like, if you had a snow accumulation device over here, could it at least remove some snow over there? running water or, and or rain? You could. You could throw some thermal in there. You could throw some thermal. So, so has there actually been like <coughs> quantum measurements of how much energy one snowflake produces? Well, 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 well no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be quantum. It's not, it's not quantum at all. It's oh, just... So uh, is there been measurements of that? Can I find that on the internet? You, you could... Um, um, that's what would be a good way to do it. Um, I'm sure there. I'm sure there's data on. I'm sure there's data on the mass of the snowflake. Yeah, and it's going to be on the other <laughs> yeah. few nanograms. But you can also. But you could also. You wouldn't have to do it on a flake by flake basis. You could just say that. 
um, you know, a, a foot of snow fell in a day, or let's just say an, an inch of snow fell in an hour, and you know that the density of snow is about one-tenth of water. So you could do it for rain, and you know the density of water is just one, uh, you know, one, one gram per cubic centimeter, and so whatever mass, you would just divide by 10. Snow has a, snow has a density of one-tenth of water. So you could do the same problem for rain, say this, this many inches fell per... Okay, so just fun. <laughs> Not for a grade, but I'll, I'll, put a, I'll put a little discussion forum on there. Okay, and then I'm realizing we actually did um, cover Chapter 2. So if there are any questions at all on it, I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights again. This is sunlight coming in. This is radiation going out away from the Earth. That's the squiggly line going in that direction. Um, direct and diffuse. We're seeing diffuse radiation all around us right now because I do not see the sun, but it's still light outside. So there's your diffuse. Um, the, that number I gave you earlier, that five watts per day, this is similar, but what it, what it is, it's, it's the number of kilowatts per square meter per day. So the numbers end up being very similar because if you get a kilowatt per square meter, multiply it by five hours, there it is, five hours per uh, square meter per day. So the two numbers align themselves pretty well. And this is exactly the type of chart you use when you go to design your solar thermal or your solar PV system. How, how much energy, how much radiation is coming in? In, Mon in Missoula, it's something like 4.4. Because then that would affect the quantity and the, uh, the area you need to cover. Yep. Specifically. Yep. Yep. So the, so the lower that number gets, the bigger the area has to get for the same amount of energy. Absolutely. Now, here's on a um, horizontal surface. So as, as we get further towards the um, poles, this is just in January. Um, that's why typically when you see these solar panels up in Alaska, they'll just put them vertical. They'll, they'll just, uh, just stick them straight out. We're right here at, at 45, so it makes the most sense just to stick your panels at about 45 on average. It's getting that maximum. Um, you know, and this is this is why we get you know more more sun in the summer, less in the winter, just in the northern northern hemisphere. There are some panels that, that tip themselves, and, and one, one thing to note is that there are essentially two degrees of freedom. So with your, with your panel, you have your um, elevation angle, which is th what these are showing. Typically, that doesn't change, but there are a couple systems. There's one at the Pease Farm. We also have one that changes the azimuth angle, so you know, changing from east to west. So one's up and down, one's east to west. You can imagine also rotating it in this direction, but it wouldn't matter. <laughs> you know, there's three, three degrees of rotational freedom, but you only need two to maximize your energy. Uh, I have a question. Sure. In climates like ours, yeah. is there an angle that's ideal for keeping the snow from accumulating? That is a really good question. Um, yeah. In fact, Solar Guy uh, talked about that a little bit too. And uh, it, it, a lot of that comes into also what you're paying for electricity. So, th so the question is, uh, let's, let's say um, you got a, you got a flat roof and you don't want to pay for the racking system. It's, it's going to cost you more to put in a racking system. Like, hey, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to do the flat roof thing. That was that, you know, one hour per day on a flat surface in January when you get up, up north. Well, then you might say, hmm, I'll, I'll get a racking system that goes a little bit higher uh, that doesn't have to be that strong because I'm not going to get that much wind under it. Now I'm going to get up to 45 where I'm pretty sure that most of the snow is going to fall off. But now, I've, now I'm, I need an even beefier racking system where I might even have to upgrade my roof 
because that's acting like a parachute and it's going to rip my roof off. So that you have to look at what's, and we, we'll get into it later, but it's called the levelized cost. So you're going to get you know, fewer photons sitting flat, because, well, both because of the sunlight and because of snow loading. You'll also get fewer if you're perfectly vertical, but you might have to spend more on the, um, the racking system. So there's not a cut and dried answer to that, but in general, yeah, if it's flat, you're going to lose some to snow. There was a building off of Brooks that collapsed because of snow yesterday. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, wow. It was an apartment building. One of the roofs just oh, gave it up. So this is, this is looking for, for an entire year, showing that right around 45, maybe even 30, you're going to have a, um, a maximum. Annual total radiation, this is kilowatt hours per square meter. And within that 15 degree range, there's not a whole lot of difference, is, is kind of the point of that. And you're never, you're never going to be zero, and you might say, well, um, gosh, it looks like it might be better to go, if I had to pick between flat and vertical, I'm going to pick flat. Lots in June, very little in December. So you look at it on an annual basis. You could somehow fashion a wind break, perhaps. Sure could. The back of the solar panels. Sure could, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, actually this is one of my favorite images because it, it's, it's sort of, takes radiation and, and turns into a neat little figure. So this is, um, this is inside the building. This is outside the building. So this is the spectrum of light after the sunlight has passed through the atmosphere. And remember last time we talked about these little uh, valleys? Those are the absorption valleys of greenhouse gases. They, they never make it to the Earth's surface. Well, some of them do. But chances are not that many are going to make it to the Earth's surface because they've been absorbed by the atmosphere. Now, they hit your pane of glass, and all of this stuff passes through, and here you are. We're sitting inside with all this great spectrum of, of light. Now, once the heat re-radiates, and remember, our bodies right now that are hotter than outer space are trying to radiate to outer space. Anything that's ha hotter than 7.3 Kelvin is radiating back. But glass bounces that stuff back. Glass bounces those longer wavelengths back. That's the magic of glass. Greenhouse, the greenhouse gas, or the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect through glass. So this is transmission. Um, all these little valleys are absorption. And this arrow is reflection. So we see all three modes of, of radiative transfer. Transmission, absorption, reflection. Right there. Okay, I love that figure. And the, these are showing solar transmittance. So what, you know, what, what total fraction comes through. And then this long, long wave IR, the stuff that you see with the IR camera when you see the, the body heat cameras. Uh, you know, a very small uh, percentage bounces back. And so you can tailor different dwellings using different glasses at different um, either times of the year or different latitudes. Does okay. solar energy actually penetrate the Earth? And Some solar off? energy does penetrate the Earth. In fact, neutrinos come out of nuclear reactions and they go right through everything. So, yeah. Uh, high, high energy cosmic rays, right through it. Yep. So it would affect Some, not much. Yeah. The tectonic plates. Um, some, not much. Yeah. Mostly just the gravitational. Yeah, I, I, yeah, just the the radiative contribution to the Earth's core. I think it's it's probably pretty minimal. That's just that's just a guess, though. Okay. Um, we also talked about the three modes of heat transfer. So conduction, two things have to be in contact, always flowing from hot to cold. Convection is, you know, blowing heat away, and then radiation is, is our photons coming in. 
This one's pretty cool too, and you'll notice this too if you're in, inside the house. Warmer air um, wants to get outside. When it hits that cold window, it falls. Colder air falls, more dense air falls. On the outside, this outer pane is warmer than the outside air and it rises. And inside what you get is another little funny little circulation going on as well. So warmer air rising and you get this little tiny uh, vortex inside your window. Design a little paddle wheel to oh, take so advantage. <coughs> Well, double panes do, but all if you can if you can remove that conduction or sorry, convection, you're going to do better. So you'll actually see some windows that are evacuated. Right. So so because all of, all of this mixing and it actually gets back to that whole entropy thing. It's just it's a, it's a little natural mixing bowl. Get rid of it and your thermal losses will be less. And so there are actually evacuated double pane out there. They have nothing inside. Nothing inside. Yeah, vacuum. Just <laughs> suck all the air oh, out. I see. Yeah. They seal it. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So you've got basically a vacuum tube in between the two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a little different. In a in a um, in a uh, incandescent bulb, you're pulling the air out so that the filament does not burn. I mean, you know, you, you kind of need a vacuum in there for that. But then in the, uh, in the um, fluorescence, you actually have a specific gas that fluoresces at a, di at a uh, certain wavelength as a function of how many electrons are pumped into it. So, yeah. slightly, slightly different physics there. But. Okay, oh, and we d I did want to touch on the U value. That is the one thing I really wanted to uh, <coughs> do. Okay. So let's let's do some U value, and it's it's watts per square meter per Kelvin. Okay, so here's a little here's a little problem to solve. Find the heat loss uh, through a let's just do one meter squared window. Um, with a temperature difference of, gosh, let's just say um, 40 degrees C. And I'm going to need to give you, um, let's, just, let's just use this right here, double glazing, hard coat, low E. And air filled. So we're going to we're going to say U equals two watts per square meter per Kelvin. Two point oh. I got a quick question. Yeah. Um, so power equals energy over time equals power over power area, and that gives you the area. Yet you gave us. Uh, power as energy over time and then energy times power over time. So that, in that equation, it was just important to, to ascertain what the power was because we were given the energy and we needed to figure out what because watts are in power you and watts are in seconds, you had to transfer the time over in seconds. And that's what you got. That many hours, that many seconds, that's how many watts will you be able to use in, those, in that time period out of that 200 megajoules. Divided by the area. I think so. I think you're divided by area. Yeah. Let me um let me come back and answer that. But here's here's the here's the question for everybody just to chew on for five minutes. So find the heat loss through a, a one square meter window with a temperature difference of forty degrees Celsius. It's it's significant, you know, uh, sixty or so degrees Fahrenheit, and there's the U value, two watts per square meter per Kelvin. So Chew on that. I'm going to pause, and Daniel, I'll, I'll be right there. Back to that problem. Yeah, and this this is um, very you know very important for building energy efficiency, as it were. So if we go back to this table, here are the U values. 
It's also worth noting, and I'll show you exactly what I mean shortly, is that the U-value is um, it's exactly the opposite of the, of the R-value. A bad U is a good R, and a good U is a bad R. <laughs> if, yeah, okay, perfect. Let me, okay, so let's, so let's go through it. So what I gave you was the area is one square meter. I gave you a delta T of 40 C, which is the same as 40 K, because it's just the difference between the two temperatures. And the U value is 2.0 um, watts per square meter. So the power, and it actually says so right up here, it says the heat flow rate per square meter. So there's a couple, and this actually gets right back to that uh, solar problem. So there's a couple different ways to write it. One would be like this, copy. Okay. Degrees Celsius equal to that of K. Degrees Celsius, one degree Celsius is equal to one degree Kelvin. Yep, yep. So one way to write it would just be this. The power per unit area equals U times delta T equals uh, 2.0 watts per meter squared per Kelvin times um, 40. Okay equals 80 watts per square meter. That's one way to do it. But here if I just, if I gave the A, the actual power equals equals U times 1 meter squared times 80 watts. So I multiplied by the one square meter. So to reduce heat loss, do you want big windows or small windows? The, big, the, the bigger the window and the bigger the U, the more you're going to lose. Right? So as, as in, in fact, the bigger the U, the bigger the A, and the bigger the delta T, the more power flows out of your house. Simple as that. Where's the biggest U in this equation? Well, single glazing. So you're gonna, you're gonna lose two and a half times more heat per unit time out of that single glazing than these other guys. And then there's your triple glazing. So then, then it comes down to the same thing. What's your levelized cost of windows? Well, I don't, gosh, I want the triple glazing soft coat low emissivity argon fill 1.3. Well, it's gonna cost you double what these other ones do, or triple. Well, is it, gonna, is it gonna save you double on your heating bill the first year? No. Is it gonna save you by the second year? Probably not, but by the fifth or, like by the fifth or tenth year, it might act, you might make your money back on your levelized cost. Because, because each year, you can, you can either, either pay for the good technology up front or pay for the energy down the road. Yeah. Every, every single economics problem works out to that, yeah. Um, my question was with the argon filled window. Yeah. So Argon is a no-bill gas. So then you're saying they vacuum all the air out and then fill it with argon? Is there like a double pain like where there's space in between? Is this the type of window that they're talking about? Or there are other windows that have no air or argon. Okay. Yeah. Because that seems bizarre to me. Yeah. I don't know. I've just never heard that before. Um, well, happens. Yeah. Insight? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they're not common. I mean, they're not, they're not common. I mean, you would not, you would not just, you wouldn't go pick up vacuum windows at uh, Home Depot, no. insulation. Yeah, and I guess if, if we went and looked up the, the um, thermodynamic properties of argon, it's going to have a certain emissivity, it's going to have a certain conductivity. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I live downtown at the Howard, and uh, their old windows, the building was built back in the 40s or something like that, maybe. And uh, single pane windows, and the heat bill was up to eight thousand dollars just last month. Right. Yeah. So. Well, sure. <laughs> my room gets freezing cold if I don't have the heater on. So. Yeah. Now here's the magic. R equals one over U. That's all it is. And the other thing is, is the the R value and the U value take into account radiation, conduction, and convection. At least they're supposed to. 
they're, they're all kind of built in there. Um, but R is, the, is just the reciprocal of U. So the units of U would be meters square, meter squared Kelvin per watt. So the units of, the units of U, we'll, we'll write it this way, the units of U, units of U equals um, uh, watts to the first power meters to the minus two power uh, temperature I'm gonna, actually I'm going to use I'm going to use theta for temperature because we normally use T for time and frequently you'll, you'll actually see this in your thermodynamics books you'll see um, I do but I'm going to just um, I'm going to use theta anyway and I can't remember what is, what is uh, theta in T. This is kind of fun. I'll just do it really quick. What was it? Q. Sorry. I think it's Q. <laughs> uh, to the minus one. So what was the? So you, I remember we did that last time. You, you, you put out the alphabet and then you just change it in the settings, the symbol, symbol. and it all change to the corresponding. Oh. Yeah. I tried to do that actually symbol. on my words and it says that I don't have symbol. You don't have symbol loaded? Well, weird, huh? Yeah, it's like too bad. Office, like, it was like Office 2013. Oh, uh, well, so. it might be loadable. You might, you might, yeah. you might just try to load from somewhere. I, I found too that on this, this version I can't use the, uh, like normally I would go like this and I would go, Get a divide, dividing division uh, symbol yeah. or degree symbol, but it doesn't. It's not working. So. so the so the dimensions or the units of R equals um, Q meter squared watts. Q is just temperature. It's just temperature. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just do it this way. T equals Q equals temperature. They're all the same thing. Yeah. Because, because like, typically when you get down to this stuff, remember, remember um, where I asked last time, I want to do a dimensional analysis. And in dimensional analysis, you use L, M, and T. So the poor T gets overused. I just didn't want to confuse time with temperature. So frequently you'll see um, theta come in. So I just, going, going from the problem down to our sort of units analysis, I just said. And so R is? R is resistance. It's the R value. When you, yeah, when you go to uh, thermal resistance, when you go to the uh, hardware store, and I say I want an R value of 13, that's exactly what it is. Resistance. Thermal resistance. Yeah, 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 yeah. So U is thermal conductivity, and R is, is um, thermal resistivity. Okay, so there's, a, there's an example problem. That's the exact problem that we just did. 144 watts, indoor temp, outdoor temp. Okay. Um, this is also showing that a lot of energy goes into heating spaces. That's where the majority of it is. So that's where, you know, if you're going to make the biggest bang for your buck, that's, that's why you should do your solar on your roof. Um, this, this one is showing a, um, uh, a heat pump. And key, key to this is that you're actually putting some kind of um, electricity in. Because as you, um, as a gas ex expands, it gets colder. The heat comes in, gets compressed, 
goes outside and then um, more or less radiates away. They didn't show it there. There's going to be a fan sitting there somewhere, sort of so blow that into it. heating up. Does it actually become closer and then at a point of breaking, it sporadically scatters? Or when it meets a colder? Yeah, the equation here. They don't. They don't really show that here. And there's a there's a couple there's a couple different things that um, that go on. So one is. Um, What is this? PV equals nRT. So as the, um, if you have a given volume and you add pressure to it, the temperature also goes up. If you suddenly, if you have something at a, at a constant pressure and you suddenly reduce the volume, the temperature goes down. So that's going on. So we'll have room to disperse. Think of it that way. Yeah, think of it that way. Um, and then the other thing that's mentioned is the latent heat of evaporation. So this is, and it's just it's just sweating is all it is. So when when you um, when you sweat, if you have fluid on your body and that water evaporates, it's actually taking energy away from you. It, it, you know, in the form of kinetic energy in the molecules that are leaving. So that's, that's, the, that's the evaporation right there. So you ha if you have the uh, evaporator, that's exactly what's going on in there as, as the gas changes. Um, or you can even think about it, um, what's the opposite of con condensation? And fortunately, this building is built in such a way that there's not excessive vapor, but if, if these windows were cold, and there were vapor, the air, the actual water molecules in the air would hit the window, get cold, and, and turn to liquid or ice. Exactly what happens. So the exact opposite happens, and you'll see it even on a um, sunny day. And if the sun came out, we could sit there and watch the cement, the concrete, heat up. The water would leave, and the water would actually it's, it's kind of weird, but the, the act of the water leaving keeps the concrete from getting that much hotter, like sacrificial water, if you will. It's sort of set the, the, as that water left, the concrete didn't get as hot as it otherwise would if it had absorbed energy. There's actually, there's actually a lot going on there. It's the same thing with breathing, too. We exhaust a certain form of energy, sure. and it's heated, yeah. and when we breathe back in, it costs energy to keep that breath back up. This is true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So here's, um, here's evaporator pipes. So you, you actually have some phase change going on in there depending on the, uh, the fluid. Um, this, this is pretty key. If you bury the evaporator coil in a lake or river, um, it's more it's more stable. You've got a, you've got a, it's like even right now out in the um, out in the Clark Fork, the um, there's liquid water down there, you know, relatively stable temp. Okay. This is just showing that. The heat's not there when you need it in the winter. That's why a lot of times we turn to, um, you know, the, the solar is not there. That's why we do turn to combustion. Um, this is also showing a little bit of some of the um, weather patterns, milder winters, because we're here near the, near the ocean where that uh, water serves as a thermal buffer. Yeah, that was another good point brought up in the uh, Solomon paper. Oh, yeah. The fact that one third of all the heat generated, uh, anthropogenic heat and otherwise, is absorbed by the ocean, and then two thirds oh, is radiated yeah. out into space. It's true. Yeah. So not, not only is a lot, not only, well, the air has a much higher capacity, to, or sorry, water has a much higher capacity to absorb uh, heat than air does. And the biggest goal is to propose uh, countermeasures 
so our deep oceans don't get heated. Yeah. Because if that were to happen, then... Yeah, another weird thing, too, is that the, the water absorbs CO2 very well also. And the atmosphere and water are always sort of in equilibrium with the CO2. So even if we start sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, the ocean just kind of burps it back up. Doesn't CO2 increase um, acidity? It does. Levels? Sure does. Yep. Okay, so here are some engineering designs for um, moving warm air around in a house. So this would typically be a southern face. And if you can do so at this latitude, you would cheat this towards the east so you get the more bang for your buck in the morning. You want the house to heat up faster and keep it away from the west because that's where you don't want the heat in the summer, right? You don't want to cook in the summer as the sun's going down. Trom wall, this is sort of a, a purpose-built wall, just like that window we were talking about with those, those um, convection gradients uh, moving. There's a really neat example of one of these up in Browning. A friend of mine designed one for the elementary school up there. And then here's just um, direct gain. What you'll, what you'll see on some well-designed houses is a, uh, an eave that will come down such that you get low sun in the winter, but you keep the high sun out in the summer. Okay. Um, all right, so here are the major components of a panel. It looks like we're right up against the uh, the hour here, but um, you know, take a look at this. The, the, these concepts do include convection, which is the water flowing. You're actually trying to limit conduction through the insulation and maximize radiation by having this thing black. And um, here's your evacuated tube collectors, and that's the point there is, is to actually uh, limit the amount of um, loss or, or re-radiation. Silver District, this would be fun. You don't hear much about that, but that looks like a blast. Just, you know, he, providing all of your local heat from uh, solar thermal. Would be ideal, that's for sure. Yeah. Here's your southern, southern facing windows. Super insulation. Yeah. And this is really that same graph showing the, the uh, when it's available and when you need it. Super insulation. That's like a page out of uh, yeah, it's one. The same picture. It might be, yeah. Yeah. Like German. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the dismal. <laughs> oh, um, if you want, I'd love to let you play with one of these two. We we have the um, we have a uh, solar pathfinder that will give you total predicted radiation for the year. Um, so if you want to play with that, we're going to bust it out for 243. Yeah, it's it's a neat neat little uh, toy. Mirrors for daylighting. Yeah, I remember seeing in the syllabus of 101 that there was a uh, specific tool that would measure the, the wattage of yeah. our um, yep. electronics. Yep. But, uh, I never went and picked it up. Yep. These two are, are there's some in Arizona. Um, so they're, they're actually getting to the point where you got steam and making electricity. Same thing here, steam for electricity. For scale, there's a little truck down there. So, Okay, see you, see you Kat, thanks. See you next time, yeah. And then, then same thing here, just, just focusing that much energy so you've got uh, your uh, Stirling engine. Um, this one too, there's a neat PBS special. Uh, in this case, you've just got hot air coming in the bottom and then a turbine in the top to make electricity. We could do it with the anaconda stack. How cool would that be? <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not a lot of bang for your buck. It's only 50 kilowatts. 
I mean, you might get a hundred, maybe a meg out of Anaconda, but there it is, just waiting to, waiting to make clean power. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get near it, can you? Oh yeah. Can you can you yeah, how, how close can you get? In the stack. Yeah. It's, really? It's impressive. I gotta get up it there. Look at when you drive by. That thing is six hundred feet tall. Yeah. And the walls at the bottom are thirty feet thick. I believe it. It's, I believe it. Is it made out of steel? Was that? Is it made out of steel? No, no. It's uh, mortar. Oh. Yeah, I'm sure there's steel in it, but like the bathroom.